Well, tonight as we turn once again to God's Word, found in 1 Corinthians, uh, we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, in most of the Pew Bibles, if you're following along in one of those, you should be able to find that on page 1,108. We're now going to be picking up steam a little bit as uh, we spent the first four chapters dealing with the single topic of the division over church ministers, and now Paul addresses a completely different division in the church, and that is lawsuits. In the church of Corinth, there were a number of people suing each other, and uh, you notice, I want, hopefully we'll notice as we read it, uh, Paul's tone here, and as we go through it, we'll see that Paul has quite a stern warning for the church in light of this. So we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians 6. Let's give our attention out to God's Word. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. And let's pray now that God would bless our understanding and the application of this word. Let's pray. Our great God and our Father, indeed, as we close out your Lord's Day that you have given to us, Father, we thank you for one more opportunity to be fed by your Word. Father, send your Spirit now that our souls would be richly nourished by this Word, that we would be built up in the faith, that we would be instructed. And Father, as we go from here, even as such a text like this reminds us of the glory of the Gospel, Father, we pray that it would impact us in such a way we would live differently in light of what Christ has done for us. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, there's a saying that I've heard a few times in my life. I think many of us may be familiar with it, but the saying is as follows. Don't air out your dirty laundry for your neighbors to see. Uh, Don't air out your dirty laundry for your neighbors to see. The saying gets at uh, the fact that people hang their clothes on the line. Be very careful not to hang dirty clothes on the line because your neighbors will be looking through the window and they're going to see what you hang out there. And so before it goes out of the house, Make sure it's clean. The saying gets at the fact that there's just some things that need to stay within the family. Uh, There's some disputes, there's just some issues that that need not go outside the walls of a home, but rather keep them within the family. In other words, things need to be dealt with not by outsiders, but by members of the family alone. Well, as we come to 1 Corinthians 6, Paul could say to the church in Corinth, Don't air out your dirty laundry for the citizens of Corinth to see. As we come to chapter 6, Paul is, in many respects, once again, deeply rebuking the church because they are going to court with one another, and Paul's main concern is that they are slandering the name of Christ because the church is not dealing with the problems within its own walls. Part of the rebuke of the text we need to understand tonight is that, that the church is not only competent to judge such cases, cases, but they should, because as spirit-filled believers, we are the place that, w- that is able to bring reconciliation among 
members within the walls of God's own house. And so Paul here wants to correct them, the wrongness of suing other members of the church, the wrongness of bringing other members to court, and the wrongness of bringing God's name in the courts of unbelievers and squabbling in front of them. And ultimately, as we end, Paul's main point of contention here is that their unwillingness to reconcile with one another is a contrary, uh, contrary living to the gospel. It shows that they are living contrary to the gospel they profess. Now, as we are reminded of the context, we are dealing with a church that in many respects has gone completely crazy. Uh, we've seen already a number of this, and it's only going to, in many respects, get a little bit more crazy. Uh, but Paul has already dealt with the divisions of the church, and, and last week we dealt with the fact that they were not disciplining a man in the church living in outward immorality. Uh, this was a church Paul had planted in Acts 18. It was a church that he loved dearly. It was a church living in a city filled with immorality and wickedness, and that wickedness was permeating the church. And in many respects, especially as we come to the text tonight, we see the church was living more like the world than they were living like the church, and that is where Paul needs to correct them. Now, I do want to point out one aspect of why uh, this is connected to the sermon last week, or, or the text, rather. Uh, Paul does have a logical flow here. If you remember where we ended in, in chapter 5, verse 12, Paul said the church was not to judge the world. God was going to judge them, but they were to judge one another. They were to be assessing one another's fruits and judging those in the church. And that is why Paul brings this up. Because they were to judge that member and put him out, but also they were to judge one another with disputes, and that's why Paul brings this topic in where he does. But here's the theme I want to tackle with you tonight. Learn that understanding salvation should result in a willingness to reconcile within the church. Understanding salvation should result in a willingness to reconcile within the church, and I have three points. They're just three points following the outline of the text. First of all, we need to note the situation. Uh, we're just going to highlight the situation of the lawsuits. Secondly, the solution that Paul presents to them. And then finally, thirdly, the salvation. The salvation that should cause them to live differently. So, first of all then, the situation. What is the situation of these lawsuits? Well, look at verse 1 of chapter 6 as we can see a few details there. Paul says, if any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints. And one of the first things I want to point out about verse 1 is Paul's tone here. In fact, Paul's tone throughout the text that we've just read is very deep in scolding. He has a, a deep tone of rebuke for them. In fact, actually in the Greek, the very first word in the sentence is to dare. It's the verb. In other words, Paul is beginning, how dare you do this? You are so daring that you would bring lawsuits against one another. You would bring each other to court. In our own English, Paul would say, how dare you as the church of Christ do such a thing? In fact, actually, if you have your Bibles open, just look at verse 5. Notice Paul is open about this. He says, I'm writing for the purpose of shaming you. Paul says, you should be ashamed what you are doing to one another by bringing people, by suing one another, you should be filled with shame. And I'm writing in such a tone that you get the hint, you should respond with shame to this. Well, what can we deduce about the situation here? There's a, a number of details we can pull together. The situation, of course, in verse 1 is that members were taking other members to court over matters of litigation. Uh, what most of the commentaries point out is that these were minor uh, matters of litigation. In fact, in verse 4, when Paul says that they're bringing people up on such matters, literally in the Greek there, that word means matters of daily life. And so these were, these were not big cases. These were not cases of robbery. These were not large cases of breaking the law. These are what I think would best be described in our modern day as small claims courts. One member ha has wronged another member. One member has uh, perhaps destroyed a piece of property of another member. And rather than reconcile, they were suing one another. Rather than dealing with the wrong as brothers in court, or in Christ, uh, they were dealing with these things in court. Again, very likely what's going on is some monetary thing. One person had taken money or some other detail. Whatever the case is, 
It was a minor, little, small claims matter, and they were not willing to deal with it as a family. In fact, one commentary I read this week described these claims as annoying and bothersome matters, not deep matters of injustice. And in fact, look at verse 8. This is what Paul says you're actually doing. Paul says, instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Again, whatever is going on here, Paul says you're actually going to court, you're fighting in front of unbelievers, and you're doing something that is cheating your brother. You're wronging one another. And so whatever the case is, they are fighting, they're they're duking it out in front of the, the judge, and they're even seeking to undermine one another. Here's the point. These are members of the same church. And from Monday through Saturday, they're taking each other to court. They're fighting with one another. They're getting in arguments in front of the judge. You can only imagine what worship is like on Sunday. I doubt there's much brotherly love on Sunday morning and Sunday evening when they spent the week arguing with one another, seeking to eke out the money that the other person might have owed. Paul says such things are shameful. Such things are wrong. Now, notice why they're wrong. Paul has a couple of arguments for this. The one reason this is wrong, why the situation is wrong, is because the church is the place that this should have been dealt with. Look at verses 2 and 3. Paul says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Verse 3, Do you not know that we will judge the angels? How much more the things of this life? Paul says, this is completely wrong. You should not be bringing these matters to the worldly court because the church is the higher court. The church is the much more esteemed court. The church of God is where these things must be dealt with. Paul says that the saints will judge the world. Uh, Paul is apparently referring to some end times, or the, the end times, when Christ will come back, that the saints will have a role, a participation in the judgment of the world. Now, if you're like me, you really wish Paul would give you a few more sentences on this. In fact, I had hoped that as I studied the commentaries this week, one commentary would open it up and and really tell me what it would mean to judge the world. But there's very little details biblically on what Paul is referring to. There's a few texts that we can flesh this out. One text is Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus, when he speaks with his disciples, says the following. He says, Truly I say to you, in the new world... When the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so that text alludes to what Paul is alluding to in some shape or form. When Christ comes back, the church, the saints, will in some manner uh, share a level of judgment, a level of authority. In fact, one commentator noted the word uh, to judge here also can mean to rule, and so very likely what Paul is getting at is the fact that the church will be given positions of authority. Whatever this is, Paul is saying, when Christ comes back, don't forget what I told you. You, the church, will join him in the authority that has been given to him that he earned, and you will rule and judge over the unbelievers. And notice that they also will judge the angels. Even more mystery there. Whether that's the demons, whether it's the Uh, the faithful angels, whatever this is, Paul says this, the church is the highest court because of Christ. You have been given the Spirit, and one day you will render verdicts. Therefore, why are you going to the world? And so I think here's the point. One commentary noted, we should not get distracted by the mystery of this because the point is clear. Whatever the specifics are of what the church will do in judgment, Paul's point is obvious. If we will share a role in judgment on Judgment Day, we should be able to share a role in judging cases among members within the church. In fact, actually, look at your text again. Paul gets sarcastic with them. Look at verse 4 and 5 in light of this rebuke. He says, Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account of the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between brothers? Now notice that last verse. Paul is getting a little feisty there. What was this church proud of? We've seen in the first four chapters that they were proud because they were holding on to worldly wisdom. And now Paul says, you who are so full of wisdom, you who think that that I'm not wise enough to preach to you, why is there no one wise enough then to deal with these cases? 
Why you who church, who are so filled with wisdom, are sending members and are going to the world to eke out the judgment? Paul says, if you are truly the spirit-filled church of Christ, do not take matters out of the church. Deal with them as a family. Deal with them inside the church. And so here's Paul's point in a nutshell. It is wrong to go to the world because the church is the higher court of authority in matters pertaining to the church. And therefore, these things need to be dealt with in-house. And the last reason the situation is wrong is in verse 6, because it tarnishes the name of Christ. Paul says, but instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. Paul says, this is just completely wrong because your brothers, your siblings, you are brothers and sisters in the Lord, and rather than treat each other like brothers and deal with it as a family, you're taken to others, and notice who they are. They're unbelievers. Paul says, you're losing your witness in the community. You are called to evangelize, you're to go to, to the unbelievers to preach a gospel of peace and love and forgiveness, and you can't even forgive one another. What does this say about the gospel Paul is getting at? What are the unbelieving judges to think when you're fighting and bickering with one another over these minor matters of money, you're tarnishing the name of Christ. And so Paul here is warning the church that what they're doing is completely wrong because they are the church. And so here's the point. Paul is saying that the church in Corinth is bringing the world into the church's problems where it should not stick its nose. The church is adequate. The church must deal with one another's problems because as a spirit-filled church, uh, we are equipped to render the judgment. Now, notice secondly, notice the solution. Paul has a word of solution to this church, which is completely countercultural. First of all, Paul wants them to admit that they're wrong. Look at verse 7. He says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. In other words, Paul says, the fact that you're taking people to court already, you need to actually own up to the fact that you've lost already. And Paul's being playful here. Why are people taking their brothers to court? It's because they want to win. Why are they dragging someone else by a litigation? It's because they want to be right. They want to win the case. They want to get their rights. And Paul says, okay, so you've won. You've already lost. By the very fact that you took a brother to court, you may win, you may lose, but you've already lost completely. Because of what you've done, you have brought shame not only upon yourself, but the church. And Paul here says, you need to begin by owning up to the fact that you've lost. You need to begin by repenting of the fact that what you did was absolutely backwards to what you should be doing as the church. And then notice verses 7 and 8 again. The big solution is to just suffer the wrong. Listen to this. Paul says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Now, doesn't that really cut to the heart of fallen man? You know, our culture constantly teaches us to go for our rights, make sure to defend your rights, and, and in the cultural sphere, there's, there's a right sense to that to some degree. But when it comes to life in the church, Paul says, just let it go. What do you care about your rights? What do you care about the little money that was owed you? What do you care about the property dispute or whatever's going on? Paul says, why don't you just let it go? Why don't you just suffer the wrong for the sake of your brother? No doubt as the church heard this, they, they would have resisted it. What is Paul getting at? Paul says, for the sake of the church for whom Christ died, why don't you act like Christ? Why don't you do what Christ did? Christ came not to hold on to his rights, but to give up his rights. Christ came uh, not to be served, but to serve. And Paul says, are you following the example of your Savior? When you hold on to try to get your just rights, you're living like the world. You need to live like Christ who gave everything up for the sake of others. In other words, Paul says, you're living according to worldly wisdom. And you now need to change your mindset to live according to the gospel wisdom. Paul says, give up the money you were owed. Give up the legal rights that you may be entitled to. Just eat the loss for the sake of love. And I think here's Paul's point, as he's going to make even more clear in a moment. Paul is saying that the church needs to act like their Savior and even suffer injustice at times. The point is to consider the greater good of your brother and the love of Christ in the church and even at times give up our rights. And here's the point. What is the solution to the problem? The problem. 
The solution to the problem is a gospel solution. Turn around and give up. Suffer the loss. Turn to your brother and forgive them. Acknowledge that it might not have been right, but forgive the brother for the sake of being the church. Paul says just give it up for the sake of the gospel. Now I want to make a point here. What Paul is getting at is not that believers just give up all their rights and always be run over. Remember, there's a specific context here. For the sake of life in the church, Paul says, be willing to give up your rights for your brother. Therefore, you will settle the account. Now, thirdly, and finally tonight, notice the salvation. This is connected not only to the text that went before, but also the text we'll see in the coming weeks. But Paul here has a a statement on the salvation the church has received. And his point here is this. If this is true of you, you need to live differently. What is the salvation we've received? Notice the warning, first of all, of this salvation. He says in 9 and 10, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice that question again. Paul has been raising this question throughout the letter. Do you not know this? Paul is saying that because of course they should have known this. But by the way, they're living, they're acting like they had forgotten this. Paul says, do you not remember the gospel? Do you not remember the warning I came to you? That for those who live in unrepentant sin, for those who persist in living like the world, Paul says they will not inherit the eternal kingdom. Now the connection to the lawsuits here is they're living like the world. Paul says, why would you want to live like the world? That's where you came from. For those people who follow that mentality... They will not inherit the eternal kingdom of God. Now, what are these wicked sins? We don't have the time to go through them. There would be much profit in going through them. But notice Paul gives a list of sins here that were prominent in the church. One is sexual sins, uh, sexual immorality, adulterers, male prostitutes, and homosexuality. Sins of money, idolaters, greedy, and swindlers. Uh, People who are striving and idolizing money. I list sins of the heart and of the tongue, drunkards and slanderers. Uh, These are people who indulge in things of this world and things of the flesh. And Paul is just giving a simple, small list saying, for those who live like this, don't forget, congregation, God is a holy God. God is a God of complete justice. And for those who will not turn, do not forget the warning of the gospel. They will not inherit eternal life, but they will inherit eternal judgment for their sins. And so tonight, believers, we're reminded by God's warning to the church in Corinth as a warning to us as well, the sobering reminder of God's holiness, the terrifying reminder of God's justice to lost sinners. You know, even as I thought on the text yesterday, as I put the sermon together, I had to ask myself the question, how often am I struck by the terrifying reality of judgment? Let me ask you the question, how often are you struck by the terrifying uh, reality of judgment for those who don't repent? The gospel warning is that for those who do not run to Christ, there is eternal condemnation of just judgment in hell. And Paul begins his warning to this church suing one another. Do you remember what God saved you from? You were not just a petty offender. You deserved eternal hell because of what you've done. In fact, that's what Paul's going to go on to say. Notice the remembrance he wants them to have. Look at verse 11. I love this text. Paul says, and that is what some of you were. Paul says, do you remember? Some of you were homosexuals. Do you remember? Some of you were swindling one another. Do you remember your past, Corinth? Do you remember who you were before I preached the gospel? You were on a path of eternal judgment. You were living a completely immoral life. Paul says, as you're suing one another, the problem is you've forgotten something. You've forgotten what Christ did for you. You've reverted to your old way of living. Now notice verse 11. This is the sweetness of the gospel here. Paul says, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says, why should you stop suing one another? Because that's not who you are anymore. You're a new person. You're not like the world anymore. Christ saved you. Now live like it. And again, we don't have the time to go through each of these terms, but notice how Paul describes them. One, they are new people in Christ because they're washed. 
It's this imagery of the shed blood of Christ purging us from the dark filth of our sin. It's a reminder of the promise in our baptism that God will wash us just as water washes our body. That the sin and the guilt that we feel on us will be dealt with if we turn to Christ. Paul says you're new because you're sanctified. A word which describes holiness, a a newness, a a difference from the world, that they are saints. And if you remember to our very first sermon on this book, that's how Paul begins. As holy believers because of what Christ has done for them. Third description, they're new because they're justified. This is that beautiful teaching of justification by faith alone. It's a word which refers to the legal declaration of being declared not guilty because Christ bore the punishment. Paul says, don't forget, Corinth, all the while you're being busy bringing one another to court, don't forget what Christ did for you. He stood before the judge of heaven and earth, and he bore the guilty consequence of your sin so that you, when you stand before him on judgment day, will be declared innocent. He says, Corinth, you've forgotten something. You've forgotten that Christ took your punishment while you're trying to bring punishment on your brother in the church. Here's the point tonight. Paul is driving home that this is who they are, by grace alone. And Paul says, I told you to give up your rights. Why? Because of all that Christ has done for you. In other words, Paul says, while you hold on to your brother with an iron-fisted hand, don't forget Christ did not do that to you, and you need to reflect the love of Christ. Turn and forgive and reconcile in the church. Here's the point tonight. Christ's saving grace must cause us to live differently. We must be people willing to give up our rights for the sake of the church and be willing to reconcile with one another. Paul is saying their greedy and selfish actions are contrary to the gospel. And I think another way we can see this tonight, notice how Paul wisely rebukes the church. He overwhelmingly heaps up the description of the gospel because it's only when we are amazed by what Christ did that we will willingly forgive one another. Isn't it true? When we're not amazed by the fact that God's own Son would willingly come to bear our hellish punishment on the cross of Calvary, until we're gripped with that, we will never be willing to give up our rights. But when you're gripped with that, you can look at your brother and sister and say, what of it? We are washed with the blood of Christ. Why would I hold this against you? You see, that's the point. The church is able to live differently when we are amazed by grace. And so tonight, as we close, just two brief thoughts of application. Two things. First application is obvious. One, we're learning tonight the church is able and must bring reconciliation among the members. I think it's one of the obvious applications. Paul says, don't take out of the church what belongs in the church. Christians, we are to reconcile with one another, and if need be, bring other brothers and sisters in to help us reconcile. Let our fights, our disagreements be hammered out in the church be judged by spirit-filled brothers and sisters so that the church of Christ will not run the name of Christ through the mud. You know, one question that came up in light of this that I think we can answer is, does this mean that Christians can't bring other people to court? In other words, does this text forbid all lawsuits? And I don't think so. I think it forbids lawsuits among believers in the church, but uh, first of all, remember in our study of Acts, Paul made use of his legal rights as a Roman citizen. And so Paul's own example is in some cases he willingly was using his Roman citizenship. I think as well there are cases of being wronged by an unbeliever and there's no courts that an unbeliever will agree to except the courts of the world. And so for Christians there needs to be spiritual wisdom in this matter. But I do believe that there are biblical times where a Christian is uh, permitted by Scripture to bring matters to a court. But I would say the text says, for dealings in the church, it should not go there. It should not go to the courts and matters within the church. Second thing to leave you with tonight, it means that being saved by grace is the way to give up. And as I noticed this, I got ahead of my notes already. But I want to end with grace again. We learned tonight that grace is the only way we will live like the church. It is the only way we will put off living like the world. And so brothers and sisters, in light of that, Let us remind ourselves every day what Christ did for us. And let us remind ourselves that we are new people in Christ. Let us not live like the world, but let us live like the saints Christ died to make us to be. Amen. Let's pray.
Our God and our Father, we are humbled tonight once again by your word and his exhortations. Father, we are people who cling to our rights. Father, we pray, humble us by the sacrifice of your Son tonight. Father, we pray, send your Spirit now that through your word we would more and more live the church that Christ has called us to be. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.